Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for its beauty. We also thank you for its significance as this is the first day of the week and the Lord's day, the day that you have appointed for your people together and to worship you in spirit and in truth through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as it is, we pray that you would guide us and direct us as we study the book of Proverbs. We ask that as we work our way through these themes and as we look specifically to your word, uh, that it would not merely be an academic study, uh, but it would be a, a also leading us in worship and directing our hearts to magnify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so let's just define some terms uh, briefly before we get into the Proverbs. The, the first word that I think we need to uh, define is the word uh, abomination. Um, in Scripture, there are actually three words that are traditionally in English translation translated as abomination. That is not always the case in more modern English translations, but typically there are three Hebrew words. Um, there is one Hebrew word that is at least as far as I know, is always translated as abomination. And it's the word that we find, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I did not look through the Hebrew in every single one of the Proverbs, but most of the Proverbs, and, and I know in those for a fact, it is the Hebrew word tohabat, tohabat, which is the, the strongest Hebrew word meaning abomination. Uh, so, what is that? What, what is an abomination? It's a noun, but when you hear the word abomination, uh, what do you understand that word to mean? <coughs> you know, it, when you say that, Hebrew, I think of taboo. A taboo, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. An abomination, uh, or to abominate, if we were to use it in the form of a verb, but uh, in, in its noun form, which we encountered this morning, uh, is something that is hated, something that is loathed. So to say that something is an abomination means that it is hated, or it is loathed in that sense. Um, with this said, uh, abomination can be used in what uh, we would call literarily poetic hyperbole. And, and we're going to encounter this, so you just need to get ready. Uh, some of you that are black and white thinkers, concrete thinkers, you're going to struggle with this, okay? So I'm just preparing you. You know your type. Um, because there is a fluidity of, of, of uh, interpretation within the Proverbs, and this is one of those words. Now, we don't encounter it uh, in that way all the time. I'm going to show you one way in which it's encountered here. Uh, but, but sometimes the word abomination can be used in poetic hyperbole, for example. Proverbs 16.12 says, It is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Now, just at, at face value, what, what does that proverb mean? What does that proverb mean? It is an abomination to kings to do evil. Now, as you're thinking about that, I want to go back to last week and remind you. Remember that Proverbs are not promises, they're not guarantees, and for the most part, they're not absolute truths. They're what we would call truisms, meaning that in general or in a specific context, it is a, a truth. And so, if because I know immediately everybody's wanting to make some sort of sarcastic comment about American government or, you know, that can't be true and this person or that person or whatever. Okay, so just take yourself and go mm, into another context, move out for just a second and think about in general what is this truth conveying okay yeah I mean in, in, in terms of abominations to king to do evil of the, the Pharisees were doing um, evil against a, a leader of that country perhaps that would that would not be good um, but, but more specifically, what does this mean? It is an abomination to kings to do evil. So kings are in a position of authority, and abomination means to hate or to loathe something. And so the person of authority knows when injustice is being done, when wrong is being done within his kingdom, um, that is not something that the king wants, right? The, the king wants 
that which is right to be done within His uh, kingdom. And, and so, for the throne is established by righteousness, uh, essentially says that, that in order for the king to maintain his authority within that kingdom, it's good and it's right for, for, for good things to be done, right? So that's sort of the general truism there. To say that it is an abomination to kings to do evil is poetic hyperbole. Uh, in, in the sense that it's not that the king says, I loathe that thing which this person is doing, but rather it, the sense is, is to experience the significance of that authority. And so the word, hyper, uh, the word uh, abomination is used there to accentuate the authority of that king or the person in uh, authority. And there'll be some other examples that I'll, I'll show you uh, as well as we work our way through the Proverbs. John, yes, is it, it's not on your handout. It's Proverbs 16.12. And I think it's going to show up again here in just a minute. Proverbs 16.12. Somebody... Yeah, we're going to see that in just a second as it can be used. But what, what, where I'm right now is more at a fundamental level as the word is used in the, in the Proverbs. It, because what I'm going to show you initially is that it doesn't always have to be uh, regarding God. Right. So uh, the second word that, that we have here is the fear of the Lord. And this is a word that I think is probably misunderstood more often than it's understood in Scripture. What does the fear of the Lord mean? Well, first of all, not a noun but a verb to fear something. Uh, Trimper Longman, a commentator on the Proverbs, says that this word has a semantic range, meaning the meaning of that word has a range that goes from what might be called respect and awe to terror. So the, the fear of the Lord uh, could be used or in, in the sense of fear, or rather respect and awe, or it could be used in utter terror. And you might say, wow, that's a huge range. How do I know when it means what? Wait for it, because you get tired of me using this word. Context. Got to be able to read, got to be good readers. Got to be able to read it. Got to be able to look at it, understand, understand the context. So let me give you an example. And this is how the Proverbs begins. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I just want to first of all focus on the first half of that uh, verse. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In the use of that word in this proverb... Would you interpret that word, fear of the Lord, as meaning respect and awe? Or would you interpret it as meaning utter terror? Respect and awe. Why, why would you say that? Why, why would you think that is the case interpretively? First of all, knowledge is something that we are gained. God blesses us. Uh, with it for, for, for something, and, a, and we would assume that that is a, a right something. And so a respect of God, an awe of Him, acknowledging that He is holy, for example, uh, would yield a benefit to us and to our right understanding of ourselves a right understanding of who God is, so forth and so on. And, and we could just play that out on a number of different attributes of God, but <clears throat> you're right. that The right use of the fear of the Lord in that context is a respect or awe. Or, for example, another one, also in the first chapter of Proverbs. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Pause there for just a second. The, I'm reading from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. The eye there is actually wisdom. It's a personification of wisdom. Uh, but then it says, Because they hated knowledge, it did not choose to fear the Lord. And so it's talking about those who do not seek after wisdom, uh, those who are, are what are going to be classified later in the Proverbs as the fool or the fools. Uh, and so how does the fear of the Lord in fact uh, 
how, did, what, how, it's, how is it used here? Well, it's used in the sense of respect and awe, a right respect, a right awe, a right understanding of who God is and how we respond to Him is what protects us from being foolish or being the fool. Or Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It's just an elaboration on Proverbs 1.7, telling us more about uh, this respect and this awe and what that yields in, in terms of our knowing God. The use here then implies a reverence and an awe of God that impacts what we believe, it impacts how we think, and it impacts what we do. Think about that. The fear of the Lord, as it is used primarily in the Proverbs, impacts the way that we think, the way that what we do, what we believe, etc. And it also serves as the foundation for true knowledge. If our desire is to be, is to know true truth, as uh, Francis Schaeffer called it, if we are to know true truth, it begins not with us, but it begins with whom? It begins with God, and not just that, but it begins with a right understanding and a right heart response to Him. And I might add then, what way may we deduce about the fool back in Proverbs 1.7? Proverbs 1.7 said that fools despise wisdom and instruction. What may we deduce from that parallelism? They have no fear of the Lord. That's right. That's the, that's the proper deduction from that. Uh, and, and therefore, it affects uh, their understanding of wisdom and knowledge. So depending on context, the fear of the Lord may imply a relational attitude. It may reply, uh, imply a right response to God in heart or in deed as a covenant child. But also, and this is one that, that uh, will sometimes kind of sneak up on you, uh, that may not be fully understood, but sometimes the expression, the fear of the Lord, can be used in a sense as an old covenant expression of faith, as an old covenant expression of belief. And the, you encounter this, in addition to the Proverbs, you encounter this at the very end of Ecclesiastes. A lot of people struggle with Ecclesiastes because they get to the end of it and they think that, that Solomon's going to say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he doesn't, does he? Because he was a number of thousands of years before Jesus, right? What does he say? Fear the Lord and obey His commandments. The expression, the fear of the Lord, as it was used in some cases, could imply a belief, a trust. And where we see this in Proverbs is, and, and many of you, this may, proverb may just jump out at you for the first time. Proverbs 16.6 says, By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Well, that proverb shouts out loud the gospel, doesn't it? That's, a, that's an Old Testament reference to the gospel. The, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is toned for. Whose steadfast love do we look to for the atonement of our sins? Us? No. God. In fact, the reader of the Proverbs might be sitting there thinking, yes, my, my love needs to be more steadfast and my faithfulness, I just need to do a better job. But Jesus turns that on its head, doesn't He? Teaching us that only God is the one who is always love. He's always faithful. He atoned for our iniquity and by fear of the Lord one turns away from evil. And in that sense, many scholars believe that that is a reference to trusting in God for salvation. All right, so with that being said, uh, I now want to move into practical application. How, how do we read, how do we understand, how do we apply the Proverbs? And let's start, first of all, with this, with abominations. Are there abominations, first of all, and this goes back to your uh, point, Don, are there abominations that according to God's common grace are typically true of people in general? Are there abominations that we could say that just apply to humanity at large? And again, at first, we might say, nope, 
No, abominations just have to do with God. But Proverbs teaches differently. Proverbs 26, this is on your handout. Proverbs 26, 24 through 25. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. Not to God. The scoffer is an abomination to mankind. All right, let's break this down. First of all, let's look at the first half of that proverb. The devising of folly is sin. What, what, what does that mean? What is devising of folly? Coming up with foolishness, all right? And how is devising, uh, thinking through, uh, uh, scheming, scheming on foolish behavior, uh, how is that a sin? I mean, we might say in, in our culture, hey, that's what we're famous for. But the proverb says that, that the devising of folly, scheming up foolishness, and the, the implication here is that foolishness is some form of wickedness, right? Or leads to wickedness. That, that would be a, a good inference to make here. Uh, how is that sin? Well, true, but let's just stay with the topic, devising folly. How, how is devising folly sin? Yeah, it could be, or, or, or just in, in, in general, uh, uh, scheming after something that, let's just think about it this way, and just as an example, and I'm not saying this is the only interpretation of this, but scheming in a way that would lead someone into sin that would lead them to fall in, into, into wickedness and devising that and thinking uh, of, of, of how you, you might lead somebody astray. Okay, so the proverb says that's sin. Now the second half says, the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. Now remember from our study last week, in terms of parallelism, when you read the second half of a proverb, there are that is 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 used employing the literary uh, method of, of parallelism. Sometimes the second half of the proverb seems unrelated, doesn't it? You think, well, that that sounds like a whole other topic. Well, pause there for just a second. What's a scoffer? What what is a scoffer? Okay, somebody who makes fun of, heckler, mockery, uh, scorning. All right. So now that scoffer is hated, is loathed by humanity. Hmm. Now what in the world does that mean? And why would humanity hate someone who is scornful? Hmm. Well, a couple of thoughts here. One is, is someone who is, is scornful, is, is someone who's not loving. They're, they're difficult to be around. Um, they're also probably somebody that can't be trusted. Uh, someone who lashes out or someone who is sarcastic to the point of, of mockery is someone who typically you, you wouldn't trust, right? But then tie in the first half of that proverb. The first half of the proverb says, the devising of folly is sin. Where, where is a, a tie-in of, of truth there between what is hated by mankind and that scheming of foolishness and sin? Ah. Now, now, you see last week when I said why, that I don't think the best way to read Proverbs is to read them a chapter at a time. We're on one proverb right now, folks. One. And quite candidly, if I allowed us, and I'm not going to, but if I allowed us, we could just park it right here, couldn't we? 45 minutes just disappear, right? This is a picture of the trial of Jesus. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, how is that? A, how would mankind hate that? Since mankind loved his death. Those that became believers would look upon that Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, that, that, that might be like a gospel kind of view of it. Could be. Yeah. Yes. Abomination. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, yeah. That, 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 that's right. And that's the general theme that's being conveyed here is that, that mankind is very concerned about someone who lays traps and, 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 and puts together a scheme that ends up leading to that which is not for, for, for the good. You've heard of the, the expression that there's, there's honor among thieves. Um, that's a general common grace expression. And so what we're seeing here is this common grace understanding of, of how mankind looks at people. We may say, well, humankind is, is wicked and fallen in sin. And that is true. Mankind's also made in the image of God. And God has bestowed a common grace upon every single human being. And that's true too. And so you see this come out in examples like that. Yes, Don? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great word to add in there. Scoffing as anarchy. Uh, that which is not for the, the common good, we might say. Mankind goes, man, that's that's just not that's not good uh, for civilization, uh, we might say. Other examples, and I've got these on your handout, I believe. Proverbs 16.12, it is an abomination to kings to do evil. I read that for you earlier. Proverbs 24.9, whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. And when he speaks graciously, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Uh, are, are there really seven abominations in his heart? I'll read that again. You can think about it. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips. Imagery, right? Not literally his lips, right? It's not like his lips go... Here's a force field. You can't see me. We know what he means. He disguises himself by, by things that come out of his mouth, right? Whoever hates disguises himself with the way he talks, what he says. Words are important. Harbors deceit in his heart. So he's always thinking about how he can deceive someone. When he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. What does the writer of Proverbs mean by seven abominations in his heart? Is that a literal expression, first of all? Yeah, no. I mean, in short, seven typically in, in Hebrew language would be perfection. So there's the perfect number of abominations in his heart. But again, it's a figurative expression. What's meant by abominations in his heart? Well, if you go back and look at the way he talks, what his heart desires to do, what he intends to do to his fellow human beings, it's all coming out of just this perfect number of hatred for them. And so when he speaks graciously, Solomon says, no, 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 don't be naive. Don't be vulnerable to, to, to that, that gracious word because inside, perfect number of hatred for you and everybody else. Proverbs 28.9 says, If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And that could be understood as an abomination to God, but it could also be, and I think rightly interpreted, as it is a hatred for anything having to do with God. And so one who turns away from hearing God's Word, in essence, inside of his heart, when he prays, and all you say, oh, well, look, that, that, that man, that woman, they say their prayers. And Proverbs says, yeah, <laughs> that's smokescreen, folks. Uh, if they don't love God's Word, uh, that prayer is just a mockery. All right, so... I know we got a lot of topics, we've gone through this, but more often than not, and now this is directly to your point, Don, more often than not, the Proverbs refer to abominations against God or what God hates or what God loathes. 
What are abominations to the Lord? For the sake of taking notes, what I have done is I have organized this into three general categories. In other words, uh, I just walked through the Proverbs and I said, okay, without a doubt, there are three things specifically that it says that are an abomination to God. And uh, we're going to, with the time, limited time that we have, we're going to look at those three. First of all, a crooked heart. A crooked heart. Uh, Proverbs 11.20. That should be on your handout. Those of crooked heart are abominations to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are His delight. Now, what is meant there by those of a crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord? What does that mean? Well, first of all, what, what does the writer of Hebrews mean by a crooked heart? Hmm? Perverted heart? Yep. Deceitful heart? Yep. Cro- crooked just implying that it's not on the straight and narrow. It's not moving toward righteousness. It's not aligned rightly with God. And so the imagery here is something that is, is crooked and, and, and not straight. And so that the, the, the uh, proverb says that the person of a crooked heart is abomination to God, meaning that God loathed or hates that person who has a crooked heart. There are several examples I want to draw to your attention here, uh, and I just went through and broke these out into subcategories. What would be examples of a crooked heart? Well, the Proverbs gives us several. First of all, a violent or devious person. A violent or devious person could be categorized as someone who has a crooked heart. Here's what the proverb says. This too is on your handout. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. All right. So do not envy a man of violence, do not choose any of his ways, for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord. Why is an, a devious person abomination to the Lord? You used the word deceitful, didn't you? Yeah, yeah a person with a crooked heart, not, not aligned with the Lord's way, is bent on deceiving. They, they want to deviate from that which is right. Yeah, Don? Yeah, that's right. And that's one of the reasons why we're told here not to envy a person of violence. Note how the writer of Proverbs ties these two together. Don't envy a man of violence. Why? Why not envy a person who's violent? Because they're not trustworthy, right? I mean, you've been around these people before. I mean, everybody can look down at the ground, not make eye contact, but every single one of us knows this person, right? It's the person that is like a stick of walking dynamite, and you're, you're around them, and everything was great, and then all of a sudden, like, like an explosion, they go off, and you're like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. That, that, that deviates from your normal behavior. In fact, that behavior that's good. Yeah, Don? Yeah, that's right. That's right. What does this then tell us in Proverbs 3? I've got that printed on your handout, don't I? Proverbs 3, 31 and 32. What does this tell us about this person's relationship with the Lord? This person of crooked heart, this person who is violent and devious, what do we learn about them? Well, true, but just in this text. 
Yeah, yeah. God, God, in fact, again, it, it specifically is personal. It's saying God hates this, this person. And again, we're not going to get into the, the, the issue of, you know, of God's for, forgiveness and God loves and so forth and so on, because that's not the point here. It's, it's using, again, the way that Proverbs are written in their terseness. They're written to, to show us these truths by being sp- very direct to, uh, to this issue. And, uh, and, and so we see here that the upright are in His confidence. And the His is not referring to the devious or violent person, is it? It's referring to the Lord. And so uprightness uh, is a virtue. Walking rightly before the Lord is something that we want to encourage in ourselves as well as others. How does the fear of the Lord then protect us from this person of crooked heart, this violent and devious person? Well, Proverbs 23, 17. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Answer? Those whom you admire, those who you look to for guidance, those who who you say, I look to them for wisdom and guidance, need to be godly people. Furthermore, we are to have a fear of the Lord, a respect and awe that permeates every part of our lives and runs with us the totality of life. Number two, or no, another area uh, under a crooked heart is lying lips. Lying lips. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are His delight. Okay, imagery, do lips lie? No, they're just anatomy, right? All right? Some larger, some smaller, some in between. That's not the point, is it? Proverbs is using this imagery to say what? What are lying lips? Yeah, yeah, a person who lies. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. The Lord loathes these lying lips. He hates these lying lips. But what about those who love uh, and desire to tell the truth? What about those who love and desire to tell the truth? Well, Proverbs 8, 7 says, For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. The people who tell the truth, who seek to tell the truth as God has defined the truth, they find that in telling the truth of the Lord, they don't allow wickedness to proceed from their mouth. Again, it's a truism, but the point here is it's a distinction from lying lips. Thirdly, under a crooked heart, the one who confuses good and evil. I am almost out of ink here. How about we just switch colors? The one who confuses good and evil. Do I have that on your handout? Okay, good. The one who confuses good and evil. Proverbs 17, 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. What's this mean? Why, why is this person an abomination to the Lord? Because why? Because it's the person who says that which is evil is good and that which is good is evil, and Proverbs says God hates that person. That, that, that person is, that is not aligned with, uh, with the way that God is. What about those who love the Lord and walk in obedience to Him? Well, Proverbs says, An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, but one whose way is straight is an abomination to the wicked. You see how the writer of Proverbs is using this word abomination and it will draw it in. You think that he's getting ready to say something that's an abomination to the Lord. And what he does is he brings it in and shows that those who are godly, their hearts are trained after the things of the Lord and that which is an offense to God becomes an offense to whom? To them, to us. That's right. How does the fear of the Lord protect us from justifying the wicked and condemning the righteous? Proverbs 24, 21, 22. My son, fear the Lord and the king. 
And do not join with those who do otherwise. For disaster will arise suddenly for them, and who knows the ruin that will come from them both. And Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of the Lord lays a snare. But whoever trusts in, or rather, the fear of man, rather, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. All right. And then, fourthly, under this, I wrote my two up a little high, didn't I? Fourthly, under this, is wickedness in thought, word, and deed. Wickedness in thought, word, and deed. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. There are six things. Pause there for just a second. Humor me. From our study last week, what is this an example of? Good. We had a great class last week. I can see I had a major impact on all of you. Numerical parallelism. Remember that? Numerical parallelism. Okay, that's it. this is an example of numerical parallelism. There are six things that the Lord hates. Pause there for just a second. Are there more than six things that the Lord hates? Yes. Why are they using six? Less than seven maybe. He's getting ready to say there's seven. No, don't get hung up on that, right? Let the poet use his poetic devices. What the point is, is not numbers. The point is the point. Listen closely. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devised wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and, number seven, one who sows discord among the brothers. That's a long list, isn't it? And if we had another 45 minutes, we'd just take that, wouldn't we? We'd just break that down. But the general point here, the general point that's being conveyed by Solomon is this. I'm using numeric parallelism. I'm using this device of poetry to show you that these specific things the Lord hates. These specific things the Lord will not put up with. And if you look through the list, we see that we are probably very familiar with a number of them. I have listed them just in a copy comprehensive sense, wickedness of thought and word and deed. There's no way we're going to get done with this. So um, uh, uh, here's what I want to do. Um, We're going to have to break this in half. Uh, And so, uh, Greg, we're now going to go from a year and a half to two and a half years. So, no, I'm kidding. Um, There are some of the topics we're going to look at, uh, there are a lot less verses. Uh, For example, we've got coming up one where I think between the two themes there's only five or six verses. So we'll be able to slow down a little bit and and look in greater detail at those. So for for sake of of faithfulness to this topic, let's do this. Let's, Let's stop here. Next week, we'll pick up and look at an arrogant heart. That's that's what's coming up here at number two, uh, an arrogant heart heart and we'll look more closely at this we'll get down to number three and that what I want to do is come back to the fear of the Lord and tie that in in terms of a Christian ethic on how we live Uh, so we're, we're going to need more time for that let me pray for us our gracious God in heaven we thank you that your word is true and that as the writer of Hebrews said it's like a double edged sword it 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 cuts in it does its work cleanly and perfectly and we thank you uh, that you have not let it, left us to guess after that which is right and wrong uh, you've been very specific in your word uh, about what you hate and about what you love and we pray that we would be a people after your own heart that we find only through trust in the Lord Jesus Christ And we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to take and apply these, that we would not certainly push them aside as relative, but we would look and see how your word applies to our own hearts. Let your word do its work through the power of your Holy Spirit. Now we ask that you would prepare us for worship. Uh, May your Holy Spirit uh, use what we have studied here and so also our assembled uh, fellowship across the street as we gather to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.